let's unpack this piece from CNN that promotes weight loss as a strategy, as a tool to reduce the probability that you'll even contract COVID-19, land in the hospital, have severe disease, or even die. Now, of course, for many of you who listen to podcasts like this and follow other health-promoting accounts, this is not news to you. We've been sharing this information on this particular channel and podcast since January of 2020 with regards specifically to COVID-19. That was our very first post promoting nutrition, sleep management, eating a low-carb ketogenic style diet, managing your, your stress and exercise. We started promoting that. You can go back to vet if you would like. January 2020 with specific context related to reducing the probability of getting severely ill with a viral infection. So this is not news. What's interesting though is now that cases have been spiraling out of control, I think the positivity rate, at least in New York City, was north of 30%. And you know that it's like five times that because there's really, you know, testing centers have really long lines. People gave up. They said, forget about it, whatever. So we know that a lot of people are contracting this particular virus. And just now, in the new year, January 3rd of 2020, it seems that CNN is saying, oh, well, guess what? There's science showing that if you lose weight, you can reduce the probability that you even test positive for the virus. Let's just throw that uh, slide here on the screen. I think this study is quite interesting. The title here is Individuals with Obesity and COVID-19, a Global Perspective on the Epidemiology and Biologic Relationships. Okay, this was published in the Journal of Obesity Reviews. Now, I want to I want you to pay special attention to this particular statistic and also remember that this was published in August of 2020. Now, this is the very first time that this network that ostensibly stands for science and is very objective and wants to save lives and the whole thing has shared information to this effect. Now, let me pause because I know some of you are going to get mad and say, well, you know, I'm being sort of partisan and partisan politics. The New York Times, out of all of the sort of legacy media outlets and Wall Street Journal, have done a good job of talking about obesity and preventative health. Also, the magazine and, and news site Politico did that piece that we reviewed back in October that, that said that essentially to the effect that diet-related diseases are largely ignored by governments but are a major risk factor for COVID-19. So we reviewed that data, but the New York Times, I think, has done a pretty good job at least of, of being a little bit more balanced when it comes to addressing the non-communicable risk factors that contribute or enhance disease severity when it comes to COVID-19. But CNN has painted this picture that essentially... There's all these perfectly healthy people that are dropping like flies. There was vi various viral news stories that we covered here. The one with Mike Schultz, the bearded nurse that uh, was definitely a steroid user from as someone who used to take steroids, I can tell, um, probably had high blood pressure and, and things like that, got severely ill. Uh, there was a lot of obese individuals. We saw Don Lemon go to the hospital in Louisiana and interview a lot of obese uh, and overweight people in the hospital type setting, right? So anyway, the point is, that CNN hasn't done a good job of creating this risk stratification of properly educating people to let them know that, you know, well, if you're overweight, if you're obese, if you have high blood pressure, if you're pre-diabetic, that you're at more risk. They created this false narrative that everyone's risk is equally the same, which according to the literature that I was about to share with you, we know that not to be true. In fact, the data clearly shows, and, and this data has been uh, talked about quite extensively at this point, that individuals who are overweight or obese have a 46% higher odds of just testing positive for the virus. That, to me, when I read that uh, last year and we shared this uh, exact study on this podcast before, that, to me, was, was quite interesting. Also, if you look here at hospital admissions, okay, what this study found is there was a 113% higher odds of landing in the hospital, ICU, 74% higher odds of mortality, and a 48% increase odds of death, okay? So again, the study here, uh, the title here, is Individuals with Obesity and COVID-19, a Global Perspective on the Epidemiology and Biological Relationship. So let's go back to the CNN article, and then we'll pause and talk about the significance here and why I think this is so important. And why I think, you know, you know, it's obvious that people are not consuming media as much from these legacy outlets anymore uh, because they don't trust the information. They listen to folks, possibly high-intensity health, Joe Rogan, um, 
other podcasts that are sharing up-to-date current information, that are sharing uh, information about treatment, early treatment, early prevention, other strategies besides just wearing masks and vaccinating and staying in your home, other strategies that can reduce the probability and lower the odds that you will get a severe infection, right? So this is why I think, you know, our institutions are losing a lot of trust. And so this article goes on to say, does losing weight reduce COVID-19 risk? This is where I was particularly interested in what studies they were going to look at, because to the best of my knowledge, there's been no prospective studies that have sort of tracked individuals that are on a diet or a weight loss program and then looked at their outcomes. But evidently there was, and there was a, a large retrospective study, not a prospective, but retrospective study that was published last week in the journal JAMA Surgery. So the Journal of the American Medical Association. And so here's the reference here. The title of this is the association of weight loss achieved through metabolic surgery with risk and severity of COVID-19 infection. And essentially what that particular study found is there was a stati statistically significant reduced uh, probability of having severe COVID-19 and also being hospitalized for individuals who had bariatric surgery and who were overweight compared to controls who were overweight and obese and didn't get the surgery. Now, the interesting thing about bariatric surgery, and I want to, you know, we're not going to continue to talk about doom and gloom. I want to weave in some practical tips here is bariatric surgery, not only does it cause weight loss, but it also causes metabolic improvement due to the uh, manipulation of how the, just the sort of functional, the structure function relationship within the gastrointestinal tract, it increases the sensitivity and the levels of the so-called incretin hormones. So it does sort of make sense that individuals who underwent bariatric surgery, if they also have metabolic dysfunction, and we talked a lot about this in the book Belly Fat Effect, for example, full-blown insulin-dependent type 2 diabetics, when they undergo bariatric surgery, oftentimes they no longer need insulin after the procedure, uh, at least initially and in assuming they continue to lose the weight and so forth. But that change in insulin necessity is actually uh, achieved before they lose any weight. So this is a weight-independent effect, which is quite fascinating. So if we just pause here and think, okay, well, it's the new year. A lot of us, a lot of you want to lose weight. What are some things that you can do and possibly mimic or mirror the effects of bariatric surgery? Well, if you eat mindfully, if you eat after you exercise or exercise, you know, even after you eat a meal, that can increase the levels of these incretin hormones. If you eat within your circadian rhythm and during, for example, during the, the daylight, when it's not snacking, you know, at midnight and having snacks outside of, you know, uh, normal circadian times, if you eat when the sun is out in a, and you optimize your body's circadian clock system, it seems that these hormones also oscillate on a circadian rhythm basis. So I like to recommend to my clients early time-restricted feeding breaking the fast at, you know, 10 or noon, something like that, and cutting, the, compressing the feeding window and stopping, you know, all meals and snacks and all that, you know, around 6 or 7 p.m. So that's going to be an early time-restricted feeding. You're doing a little bit earlier in the day, uh, and you're, you're starting your fast earlier in the day as well. So remember, your body's circadian clock system and your gut and the incretin hormones that are a big mechanistic target and are ascribed to all many of the health benefits linked with bariatric surgery are increased. So keep that in mind. And we're going to continue on and talk about why this article, the timing of it, is a little auspicious. We're going to talk about the syndemic concept. And I think it's important to recognize this, especially as we understand the breakthrough cases are increasing in their sort of prevalence. Um, and many people are, are hoping that that you know, to get all the benefits of vaccination, but we should be consider considering healthy living and lifestyle change. And the, the paper that we're going to unpack very soon here is titled Global Pandemics, the Interconnectedness Between Obesity, Impaired Metabolic Health, and COVID-19. Now, before we do, friends, I just want to welcome you back. Thank you, as always, for being here. It's Mike Mutzel, and if you're enjoying this content, a few things that you can do that would really actually help other listeners that have similar interests as you and folks that need to know this information is hit the like button on that video. If you're in iTunes, you can share this directly with a friend. Just say, hey, check out this podcast uh, and also share this on YouTube. That goes a long way because over the last 20 months that, that we've been talking about you know, the, the lack of focus on the science that, actually, that can actually reduce 
the risk factors that are also linked with increases in hospitalizations and disease severity, uh, our platforms have been throttled back a little bit. So when you can share this directly, that really helps us go a long way. Also, friends, um, if you're interested in taking one of the world's most novel, unique electrolyte combinations that we put together, that I specifically put together through our sister brand, Myoscience, I want to give you a little bit more information about this. This is launching on the 16th of January. Really amazing product. It's the electrolyte sticks that futures magnesium, calcium, potassium. You got your creatine, you got your rebin real salt. So what makes this different is electrolytes commonly future USP derived sodium imported from China. And what we're trying to do here is pair minerals that are sourced here in the US and including real salt. You want real salt, not some USP synthetic stuff imported from overseas. But what also makes this product unique is it futures creatine. So a lot of electrolytes don't have creatine. Creatine actually helps with the absorption of the electrolytes. There's several studies to show that. So this is a multi-ingredient electrolyte that is convenient for you to take and use. You can bring it in your gym bag, you can bring it in your backpack, you can bring it on a road trip or traveling uh, in a stick formation. So we have our last and final pre-sale here that ends on the 15th of January, which is if you buy one bottle, you get the second bottle half off, okay? So when you go to myoscience.com, you put two in your shopping cart. When you go to checkout, you're only going to be paying for 1.5, if you will. So the URL, if you want to save on this unique formulation, is myoscience.com. That's M-Y-O-X-E-I-E-N-C-E.com, myoscience.com, and check out the new electrolyte sticks. I think you're really going to enjoy it. Okay, so the data has been quite clear, and that's why a lot of folks are actually critical of CNN just now, 22 months later, saying, oh, gee whiz, maybe we should focus on obesity. Maybe we should be encouraging weight loss. Now, the challenge with that, and I, I wanted to do my due diligence before I you know, put out this information, is I went to CNN's website. I went to all the other, you know, many other legacy you know, network top 10 um, news sites to see MSNBC, ABC, CNBC, all these other outlets to see if they're talking about weight loss, if they've mentioned that obesity is a risk factor, um, what are they promoting in terms of new year, new you, uh, weight loss solutions? And I wasn't finding a lot of information outside of this recent post. And that's disappointing because, again, the data suggesting that obesity is a, a complicating factor when it comes to this particular pathogen has been known for a very long time. In fact, we talked about the, uh, the HL Pivot Network, and this is the Healthy Living for Pandemic Preparedness Network that uh, came out of, of various public health uh, scientists at uh, somewhere outside of Chicago. I can't remember exactly. I think it's Rush and a few other hospitals uh, in the Chicago region saying, hey, look, we're, we're not really prepared as Americans to actually combat two different epidemics that, that are, that are you know, a syndemic, that is. You know, you have the viral outbreak and then you have all these metabolic disease and obesity occurring at the same time. So we should be focusing more on exercise and, and, and we shouldn't be locking people in their homes. And why are we closing gyms, but leaving fast food restaurants open? So, you know, this data has been out there friends, but it, it was ignored. It was completely ignored. And I don't, I can't get into these people's heads. I don't know the intent, but the challenge here is that when the networks, you know, because they have a big reach, we know a lot of people consume these, the content that these networks put out, there are unintended harms associated with all of the so-called fear mongering that they promoted through their own uh, networking, uh, through their own reporting. Uh, and so this paper was from the CDC. It's titled Longitudinal Trends in Body Mass Index Before and During the COVID-19 Pandemic Among Persons Between 2 and 19 Years of Age. We've reviewed this data, and this data is actually very, in my opinion, quite depressing. So what's new about this data uh, set, and so this is getting to the unintended harms of omitting this information. That's the whole point of this podcast. It's frustrating when, an, when a news organization stands for objective, scientific rigor uh, and unbiased delivery of information is selectively omitting data that is actually helpful for people. I, I guarantee you, if Anthony Fauci or Rochelle Walensky were to go on national television and say, we've, we've looked at the data, we're seeing cases are going through the roof, we realize that we also need to include weight loss. We need to include exercise. We need to include intermittent fasting. We need to ha have people uh, cut out sugar. Maybe don't totally drop sugar entirely, but no more sodas. Uh, maybe just make it to 10 grams a day. I think I, I talked about this before. Eat in a 10-hour window. 
have at most 10 grams of sugar per day uh, and get 10,000 steps a day. I mean, there's just 10 by 10 by 10. I mean, this would be so easy for people to do. I mean, just because I know there's all these like phrases, stay home, stay safe, flatten the curve, right? If we could just do, you know, three by 10 or something along those lines, some marketing person could make it a little bit more catchy. That would be attainable for most people. So you could still have a cookie and have five grams or eight grams of sugar. You know, you could still do eat mostly what you want as long as it's in a 10 hour window. That's feasible for most people. I, I guarantee you, my friends, we would reduce the, I mean, again, the concern here is the hospital's overfilled. That's like, life is contingent upon hospital capacity, right? If the hospitals get overfilled, we close the schools, we close the gyms, we close the business, we close, you know, your your fitness studio, your yoga studio, and you, and we have to lock people in their homes. I mean, that's kind of, so if we're worried about hospital capacity, Shouldn't we also be concerned about, well, how, how do non-communicable diseases, that is the obesity, the high blood pressure, the diabetes, how do those diet-related and lifestyle-related diseases impact hospital capacity and the risk factors for having a severe infection that would necess necessitate a hospital bed, right? And we've ignored that. And the thing is what we're hearing in the media, and that's why I have this image here from the CDC, this what's new and what's added by this recent report that we talked about in September of this year is that obesity and overweight rates and the prevalence of that, and this is not good news, but I have good news that I'm going to share with you about how to address this going forward, is these rates more than doubled in kids between the ages of 5 and 11. Okay, so this is really not good. We have, we have really accelerated the rate that obesity is occurring in our children. Now, the downside and sort of why this is saddening, why this is problematic is there's a term, and we've talked about this, called recidivism. And what that essentially means is that it's much easier to gain weight than it is to lose weight. Once individuals, especially younger children, start to gain weight, it's hard for them to, to reverse course. It's not impossible. It's doable. But it's much more challenging because of homeostatic set points and resting metabolic rate and hormonal output. So that is the problem. Now, what we're hearing about in the news is, guess what? The, this Omicron variant is causing children to be disproportionately hospitalized at higher rates. Now, part of that we need to understand is that is sort of what happens in this endemic phase. When a virus is endemic, there is a much higher percentage of kids getting hospitalized. That is not, uh, you know, that's not new. This has been known for influenza for a long time. If you kind of look at at the trends that you start to see as a virus or an outbreak goes from a pandemic phase to an endemic phase is there is a shift in the in the sort of the case demographic, okay? But we can also sort of posit and hypothesize that our own interventions made children more susceptible to even having more severe outcomes uh, and having more severe infections. And we know, again, that obesity is a risk factor uh, and that's a problem. And we've made kids more and more fat, depressed, if you look at mental health uh, scales and proxies of evaluating mental health and, and well-being, we know that kids are suffering uh, at, at much higher rates because of the isolation, because of the masking, because of the staying on computer screens and, and how circadian rhythms are really perturbed by light exposure uh, in children in particular because their retinas are more sensitive to light. So this is stuff we should care about. And again, if we're serious about keeping kids out of the hospital, we should be serious about what kids are eating in school and what parents are feeding them. We reviewed this article. It's worthy of just revisiting here in the new year. And this was published again in, I think this was JAMA. Uh, yeah, it was JAMA. Uh, Trends in consumption of ultra processed foods among U.S. adult, U.S. youth aged between two and nine. So this is between the years 1999 and 2018. And essentially what this study found is that children, 65% of the energy that they eat comes from ultra-processed, hyper-palatable junk food, okay? Now, we know all the parents out there, you see them, you know, when they're walking their kid to school that the adults don't have the mask on, but the kids do, presumably because they're, un, they're unvaccinated or they're partially vaccinated or they haven't had a booster or because they're worried that other kids are going to be exposed to haven't yet been vaccinate, vaccinated. I got, a, I got a small story on that. Uh, we'll get back to the junk food. Uh, let me just share this. So uh, I go to a holistic dentist, really nice uh, clinic, great people, and so forth. And I, I had my sort of checkup, my annual, I go twice a year, biannual checkup. 
uh, and my dental hygienist, really nice lady. She's local here, has a couple kids, uh, and you know, a small family, and, and a lot of family in the in the Pacific Northwest. And you know, we started to talk, and I just you know said, hey, you know, how was your Thanksgiving? She said it was okay. It was a little quiet. And I said, well, you know, why was it why was it quiet? Uh, well, well, I've been vaccinated. My husband's been vaccinated. We've been boosted. Our kids have been vaccinated. She has a ten and I think a twelve year old. Uh, but, but we didn't feel comfortable seeing other family members, even though they're all vaccinated, because they go to school with kids that might not be vaccinated. So I started to think to myself, okay, so you've had a booster, your kids have been vaccinated, they're young, you're all pretty young and healthy. I know she's a runner, her husband's active, the kid is active too, like a, a elite snowboarder or something like that. But yet they're so worried about maybe that their kids have been around other unvaccinated kids and that their kid would get a breakthrough infection and they all get really sick. So they, they didn't do anything for Thanksgiving. And this is the media fear-mongering, creating this illusion, this binary, unrealistic reality that society is either vaccinated or unvaccinated, and there's no in-between. And if you're, if you're questioning the vaccine or you have natural immunity, you must be an anti-vaxxer, which is not the truth at all. A lot of people, there's a lot of gray area here, right? Someone like myself, I had a mild course of infection. I have antibodies. Why would I get a vaccine for something for a disease for which I've already had and the rates of reinfection are incredibly low? Everyone around my family has gotten Omicron uh, and my mom has it, my brother has it um, and everyone's seemingly doing quite well. I have not yet been re-exposed. Uh, I mean, I've been re-exposed, haven't been reinfected, right? So anyway, the, where I'm going here is the media has created this illusion that the only way to climb out of this crisis is multiple immunizations, multiple face masks, and and more you know government issued directives to keep people safe. But yet we they conveniently omit uh, all of the the lifestyle factors, the diet related influence on non communicable diseases and how those very diseases influence risks uh, that that drive hospitalizations and also reduce the efficacy. Of vaccines. That's, they've ignored that, which I think is a really uh, big deal. We, we've covered that data and we're going to continue to cover that because a recent study, uh, as you may remember, uh, that was published, it was just yesterday, found that, you know, guess what? That uh, immunizations, and it's this one right here. So the association between physical activity and immunogenicity of an inactivated virus vaccine against SARS-CoV-2 uh, in patients with autoimmune rheumatic disease. And what this study actually found is that people uh, who have autoimmune diseases, uh, if they're physically active, their immune system creates more protective levels of antibodies compared to individuals who are sedentary. And these values in terms of seroconversion, uh, these, are, these are the conversion rates of protective antibodies to neutralize SARS-CoV-2, were statistically significantly different uh, in individuals who are physically active versus those who aren't. And so we've, we've talked a lot about this before. Um, you know, we also reviewed this study. Central obesity, smoking habit, and hypertension are associated with lower antibody titers in response to COVID-19 mRNA vaccine. Uh, and again, here's these images. I know you've seen these before. I just want to share them again. It's really important to understand that abdominal obesity, exercise insufficiency, these are all factors that reduce antibody titers in a post-immunization window. So, you know, I wanted to say, you know, to this very nice dental hygienist, well, gosh, I mean, do you feed your kids healthy, real food? Are they exercising? You probably don't have a lot to worry about, especially if they've also been immunized at this point. Uh, but we, we can't have these conversations uh, be, because the media hasn't yet sort of planted the seeds. You have to listen to sort of conspiracy theorists to even get this information, which is coming full circle. That's why I'm sharing this with you. Because this information, my friends, is out there. I've had arguments with mainstream doctors who are very pro-vaccine and say, hey, look at all these breakthrough cases. Shouldn't we have maybe not advised people and promoted free donuts? I mean, just a few months ago, less than 90 days ago, CNN was promoting Krispy Kreme's free donut offer and suggesting people take advantage of this and go and get your booster if you haven't yet got that. And, that, and just a few days later, they're talking about weight loss, okay? So sometimes in life, two things can be true, but in this particular situation, they're not, right? We can't be promoting free donuts and also say, oh, by the way, weight loss is protective because we know free donuts are not really conducive to losing weight, right? Uh, so you, you catch the drift. So let's finish off here with something that, just a practical tip, just some take-home homework. What can you do? We know that circadian rhythms and light at night 
are really problematic when it comes to trying to lose weight. This is the biggest thing that I find with my clients. Most people do not have blue light blocking glasses. Most people are going to bed way too late. I have people that are going to bed at one o'clock in the morning, 12 o'clock. It's way too late, friends, because that circadian rhythm disruption, artificial light at night, especially during the longer, darker nights are problematic and they cause desynchronization of your circadian clock system, which, guess what, alters hormone levels. It goes back to those gut hormones that we talked about, the cretin hormones with uh, bariatric surgery and that study that CNN highlighted. So this is very important. So one of the things that you can do is you can start eating earlier and start going to bed earlier. Okay, so make it a habit this year to say, look, I'm going to go to bed at 10 o'clock at night, 9 30, 10 o'clock at night. It will change your life, friends. And if you don't yet have BJ Fogg's book, Tiny Habits, and you don't know about his behavior model, uh, let me tell you a little bit more about that. So basically, this is the BJ Fogg behavior model. Highly suggest you get this book. It's really, really interesting. So essentially what you want to do is find enough ability and motivation and the triggers to get your habit above this action line. So you want to be sort of north of this red line here. So how do you do that? You need to make these things easy to do. Set your shoes out the night before so that you go to, go to the gym or you go for a walk in the morning. Uh, what you can do is put your phone to bed. If you, if you're, problem like my problem can be uh, is just looking at YouTube videos, doing research and things like that at 10 o'clock when I shouldn't be. So what do I do? I put my phone to bed. Okay. So what does that do in terms of this BJ Fogg behavior model? Well, if you see triggers fail here, so if I put my phone and make it really hard to do, even if my motivation is high to go on Instagram or go on YouTube or do research, it's going to be hard because my phone, it's hard to access. I, I'm not able to Again, here's the ability line on the x-axis. I'm unable to access my phone. So if you like cookies and you like snacks, you can have a little bit, but increase the friction, make it harder to do. So even if your motivation is high to crush a few cookies or have that ice cream, hide it. Put it in, a, don't get, bring it in the house. Make, make, reduce your uh, ability to do that. And so that you, you don't uh, cave to that trigger of, oh my gosh, I want ice cream. So this is the BJ Fogg behavior model. We're going to do a lot more about this. Uh, this book has really changed my life. BJ Fogg is amazing. Is at Stanford University. I will link his book, Tiny Habits, below. Highly encourage you to check it out. And I think we're going to do a couple of videos just to really unpack this and solidify this because, look, there's a lot of things that we all could and should be doing this year to achieve the goals that we want. And it's just these tiny habits that are getting in the way of us and our goal. And if we understand behavior science that is eloquently outlaid in this book, we can change those habits for the better. So just wanted to leave and part ways on a positive note, not be doom and gloom and talking about CNN and obesity and all this, but we're frustrated by CNN's, you know, sort of talking about this, I guess better late than never, sure. But then please don't censor uh, people, don't delete accounts, uh, don't throttle back or sort of shadow ban uh, people on social media for sharing this information like many of us have been doing over the last 20 months uh, because the data has been there it's just been chosen to be not taken seriously right so friends as always thank you for doing all the way through i really appreciate you uh, if you enjoyed this video this podcast you can leave us a, a, some feedback over on itunes you can leave us a comment below i want to know what you think i will link all these articles that we talked about today in the show notes below and we will catch you on a future episode down the road until then be well bye now yeah.